So I, I'm most curious if we could talk about your experience with large-scale restoration with a lens looking at California's recovery from the fires. And if you want to talk a few minutes first about your regenerative camps and kind of lead it into that, we could, but I'm too well, maybe, to just Well, maybe we'll keep it. that separately okay. if you want to talk specifically about uh, restoration. Yeah. And restoration of, say, disaster areas or, I mean, Often, I think we're, we're thinking about wildfires or we're thinking about flooding or drought as a natural disaster. Or an, and it's actually an unnatural disaster because it's caused primarily, I think, we, 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 we sort of need to recognize that we're in the Anthropocene. So we've come to this conclusion that we have this power to alter the infrastructure and create transportation systems and giant buildings and whatever. But the fact is that human beings have been fundamentally ignorant of natural ecological systems. So we, we've been baffled by the atmosphere and the weather and climate regulation and the hydrological cycle and soil fertility and the role of biodiversity. So these things haven't meant anything to us because we, and having studied this for a while now, it seems like, you know, having, having studied this for a while now, it seems to me that we're, we're kind of looking at, um, at, at, uh, Oops. Um, we have, we have this close for a reason. I mean, okay. I'll open it up in a few minutes. Okay. I was doing an interview there. Oh, but I really forgot. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, of course. You're I'm just here. Sorry. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Thank you. I will. Stay out of your way. Thanks. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I think in, in some ways, human beings through historical time. So what, what I found in my research because I became fascinated with why the cradles of, of, of civilization all over the world collapsed. What I found was that over historical time, human beings have made many, many mistakes. We have been unaware of what was happening from an ecological perspective. We've been very interested in our cultural development or our intellectual understandings or what we thought were intellectual understandings. But, Basically, they were kind of our musings and, and trying to try to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think we're all in that in that we, we all have that shared thing that we need to understand. Why are we here? What is life? And what, what is the meaning of death? And, you know, those sorts of things. So um, as I as I pursued ecological understanding through research, I found that all of the cradles of civilization had collapsed. Mm -hmm. And they collapsed because the people, the cultures that emerged, they didn't understand that they were dependent on, I mean, maybe they might have known, but they didn't understand how the processes worked mm -hmm. to maintain the atmosphere or the fresh water system or the soil fertility that created the food or the, amazing biodiversity which was there when they first arrived. Yeah. So they altered all this and altering all that has huge consequences because the atmosphere is created and constantly filtered and continuously renewed. Mm -hmm. And that's true of the hydrological cycle, that's true of soil fertility, that's, and, and so the biodiversity and the, and the trends which are happening through natural evolutionary outcomes that lead to climax systems are not accident. You know, they're, it's not, they're not accidental, they're not magical. Mm -hmm. They're symbiotic relationships between living organisms. So it's a type of intelligence which is a little different than like cognitive ability and language. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, in this case, it's a higher form of intelligence because it's, it's regulating life support systems 
to create a, a, a system on, on the planet, a planet which can support cognitive life forms like human beings. So this is, this is extraordinarily different than we thought that these, you know, if we looked at plants and trees, we thought, oh, they're lovely aesthetically or something like that, or, you know, isn't that interesting? And, you know, maybe we start to learn a little bit about their physiology or how they move, create starch sugars through photosynthesis or whatever. But <clears throat> we really need to look very deeply at these processes because this process of respiration is creating an oxygenated atmosphere. From, uh, from an atmosphere that had different types of gases. And it's sequestering carbon, and it's putting the carbon into the ground. And we're, we're <clears throat> a little bit over-focused probably on carbon right now. We need to recognize that that's part of an integrated system. It's, it's, it's extremely complex, but it's not something that we cannot understand. So anyone who follows this line of reasoning and who looks at the data sets, it's actually impossible to come out with another interpretation because this is what's happening. The, the earth is breathing. All living things are breathing. And that means that they're in symbiotic relationship with each other. And the, the mistake that human beings have made is to say, we're, you know, so way too arrogant and believe that we, everything is there for us. We can just take whatever we want. And this type of behavior leads to ultimately collapsing the systems that created, constantly filtered, and continuously renewed for all time. You know, so I mean, we're, looking, we're looking at kind of different times. You have cosmic time leading to geologic time, leading to evolutionary time leading to human history. And then <clears throat> from this, human history is just the tiniest portion because you have all this development and that was not nothing. That created an oxygenated atmosphere, a fresh water system, so huge, amazingly fertile soils, and tremendous biodiversity. So essentially, that's paradise. And into paradise, human beings began to just make things, take things and make them. And they said, look at this thing I made. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. And well, it's quite clever, but no, it's not in comparison to, you know, biochemical photoreactive process that creates an oxygenated atmosphere on a planet. No, it's, it's a thing. And we value this thing higher than, than the systems that created and supported life for all time. Well, this is a mistake. And this is what our religious texts tell us. So if they tell us that, uh, that um, the you know, human beings emerge in paradise and then we sin, then we, 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 we have to look at this and we have to realize, well, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true that that human beings emerged in paradise. So an oxygenated atmosphere, fresh water systems, fertile soils, and biodiversity, that's paradise. So you can't even find that in any other planet. Theoretically, there may be other planets or something, but, but we don't know where they are, and they're too far away to go, and the, the radiation in space is too difficult, and you know, it's, it's ridiculous. So you know, to, to live on the Earth and to realize that this is the case, and then, we trash it, we destroy these systems. And that's what you see if you go to the cradles of civilization and you find war zones there and you find deserts and you find like people who are confused and miserable. So, so what, what we see now is that the, the situations that we are calling um, natural disasters, they're actually cause and effect. So we're, 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 we're learning that the temperatures on exposed soils, so the surface of the earth, the temperature at the surface of the earth is vastly different 
when you remove the organic layer, when you remove the vegetation cover, when you lose the canopy and the sunlight directly hits the ground, this is vastly more warmer, you know, hotter, really. And so, you know, we, we, we kind of look at global averages when we talk about climate differences. So there's been this discussion of two to four degrees or 1.5 degrees centigrade in the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on, on Climate Change. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has been gathering a lot of global scientists who've been looking at this. And then they say, well, within a certain average range on the Earth, we, we, we need to stay within that, and we're already outside the, the criteria for the period where human beings have lived and have emerged as the dominant species. So we can look back through time and see that we were not predators. We were prey at, at one point, but then we learned how to use fire or learned how to make knives and spears and bows and arrows, and we became predators. And then we, we went further, and we could even make, you know, guns and bombs and all kinds of things. <laughs> Speaking of guns and bombs. Yeah, so don't, don't shoot. <laughs> okay, so, so finally, what we see now is that the, the cause and effect that, so if you, if you have wildfires, and you have mudslides, and you have erosion, you have drought over multiple years. And, you know, you, you think, well, I wonder what that is, you know. And, and we think, well, let's, let's use less water, or you know, can't wash your car, or water your grass, or something. We need to look systemically at what's happening. So part of it is use of water. But really, part of it is the hydrological cycle. What is happening is the, is the water infiltrating and retaining. Is the respiration that created the system constantly filtered and continuously renewed the system, is that still functional? Well, if you've lost the vegetation, or vastly reduced the vegetation, or even if you've taken the canopy, which was very high. I mean, here in, in California, you can see that the highest canopies on Earth are over 100 meters high. Mm -hmm. So in these, these ma magnificent ancient mm -hmm. life forms. And what you realize is that this, the canopy, the height of the canopy, determines the, the, where sunlight begins to diffuse. Mm -hmm. So below whatever the canopy is, whether it's an inch and a half high, or whether it's 100 meters up there, that's the point which intercepts the, the solar radiation. And the solar radiation spectrum is very large. And so it's providing everything, heat and warmth, but also quite serious radiation that we cannot stand, and that's why also the, the, so certain organisms would be, you know, skin cancers that are caused by overexposure to various types of radiation. Mm -hmm. And so the Earth has, has actually evolved to create, to create like the ozone layer to, to mm -hmm. filter this out. We, we have to also realize that the greenhouse effect is not something to vilify. It's not a, 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 a terrible thing. It's a thing that made it possible for us to emerge as the dominant species. Mm -hmm. So without that, we don't have a, a, a moderated range of temperature. But what we've done now is that we've, we've acted as if there was no consequences to raping and you know, extracting and burning and, and, and altering the systems, we have just acted as if we can do whatever we want, and you can't. And this is also what the religious texts were telling us thousands of years ago, you will reap the whirlwind, is what it says. So when you don't understand this and you act in this 
kind of self-centered, selfish, egotistical way, we can see what the outcome is. So there's a cause and an effect. And what we have in the, in the disasters that we're seeing is cause and effect. So if you expose the soils, till, use monoculture, remove the ground cover. So, I mean, the whole concept of annual planting and cultivation, where does this come from? I, I, I like to call this guy Og. Og is the Neanderthal who decides that, that uh, who creates Neolithic agriculture. So he, he looks and he sees this one plant and it's just heavy with these seed pods and he goes oh I can eat those you know that's really great and he looks at the other plants around them and he says I, I don't want them I don't like them and so he takes his sharpened stick so he's a, he's got a sharpened stick and that's where he's at in terms of technology so he says I'm gonna stab around here in these other plants and kill them. Hmm. And I'm going to then spread the seeds out. And he does three things in one go. First, he creates plowing by hmm. cultivating with his sharpened stick. Second, he creates the concept of weeds that these plants, which he doesn't know and he doesn't understand what they're for, he says, well, I don't like them, I don't want them. And he says, I kill them, they're weeds. And third, he spreads this seed all over, so it's now a monoculture. So he created plowing, the concept of weeds, and monocultures all in one go. Now this guy should definitely have a prize for you know, incredible stupidity and arrogance and horrible ultimate outcomes. Because what happens is, all the processes which have evolutionarily generated the systems which we rely on for life are impacted by this action. And then people for hundreds of generations following Og are like, well, what should we do? Well, let's do what Og did. You know, let's, let's plow, let's spread the monocultures, let's, you know, get rid of the weeds. So now we have like, Herbicides? Oh, like, let's let's put poisons there. You know that'll be good. What could go wrong? You know, it's breathtaking when you absolutely understand it and you look at that and you think, you did what? What are you thinking? You know. So anybody who studies permaculture, anybody who follows this considers what they're eating and that they don't want any pollution or and they they understand the role of biodiversity, once you get into the higher orders of, of transformation and the, the evolutionary trends, you, you see, oh my goodness, you know, biodiversity is like this amazing higher order of function. So I, I've been speculating over a long period of time that there's a hierarchy of function. So you see microbial activity, these are very er early evolutionary outcomes, precursors to successions of, of complexity. And so the simple things like gravity when the water drops fall, well that's pretty simple, you know. So gravity, we didn't know about gravity, you know, until Newton, you know, really described Newtonian physics, you know. So but, but, but now that we think about it, we go, well, that, pretty much works, you know, the apple drops, oh, thank you, you know, and you have to say, well, gravity works, you know, so any kind of physics is going to drive a, a, lo a lot of these things. That's very simplistic, but it's very powerful, and it, and it becomes very big, um, you know, when, when it happens. So when you get water, in large quantities flowing, the, the power, the kinetic energy embedded in this is huge.
Do you think this is affecting? It, it might be, yes. Let's take a moment in this mess. Well, I think yeah. if, if, if you don't picture. understand the causes, exactly. you can't understand the effects. And then if what you don't do you understand have? the effects, and, and yes. so essentially you're looking at cause and effect. Yeah. The reduction of vegetation has caused the reduction in respiration, mm -hmm. the reduction in the accumulation of organic materials which affect the microbiologic communities. And then it's massively risen the temperatures, and it's massively risen the evaporation rates. Mm -hmm. So instead of, like, there is a term, an uh, ecological term, that's evapotranspiration, which is the combination of evaporation and respiration. I actually think it's probably better to separate those and to look mm -hmm. at evaporation and respiration. So there have been mistakes. It's, Ecology is a new science, you know. but it, what, what, what evapotranspiration is discussing is that there are these multiple symbiotic effects. So evaporation and respiration combined is a thing. So these are like a, a multiple of in, influences which are causing a system to react in a certain way. But when you separate those and you realize what well, evaporation rates wildly increase when the temperature differentials change. So now if you've devegetated and your temperatures are wildly higher on the surface, mm -hmm. then you're driving evaporation. And because you've lost the vegetation, your respiration is less. Yeah. So now you have no respiration, for instance, in a, in a really massively degraded system, mm -hmm. but you have huge evaporation. Then you have some other phenomenon that you have to realize. You have to realize that in order to stimulate precipitation, you have to reach critical mass. And when you, critical mass is based on having, for instance, 21 grams of moisture per kilogram of air. So if you're unable to reach this particular threshold, the concept of precipitation is not on the, not, not, you're not planning to have rain. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to understand that respiration has other effects because it has volatile organic compounds which are emitted in respiration, mm -hmm. which are part of cloud formation. So it's sort of necessary for the aggregation. So just as it's necessary for 21 grams in a kilogram of air to reach this point of, of critical mass, you also have, have the larger effect of gathering uh, moisture into clouds. Mm -hmm. and, so you, and then you also have the, the nuclei for actual individual raindrops. Mm -hmm. So something, some substance must attract the moisture to become a droplet and to go down. And then the, the the effect of the moisture is either the kinetic energy of the, like when you have a deluge and the water is coming down and it's flooding around, that is kinetic energy. But when you have a canopy and the raindrop hits the top of the canopy, then it starts, to, it, it, it dissipates and it all, and you can walk in a forest under a canopy and it's raining hard and you're just being misted, you know. so. Once, and then you, you realize that that changes the temperature, that changes the relative humidity, that changes the density of the air, that changes the temperature, which causes movement, wind, and, and, and direction of wind, and wind speed, and all of these things. We're now affecting, so we're affecting those things. And so if you look at the, this is, there is a level of complexity in what I'm discussing. There. But it is not something which cannot be understood. So there is a level of complexity in what I'm saying, but it's not something that cannot be understood. It is possible to, to realize, well, if we know a little bit about physics, it's not like we know everything. You know, how did the constellations connect to everything or what's in minute molecular theory? But we can sort of begin to, to contemplate these things. And when you contemplate these things for a little while, 
go, well, you know, it sort of seems like that to me, you know, and, you know, there is something to that, and then maybe you can talk to some of the top experts in the world, and you say, well, look, it looks like this to me. And they don't say, no, you're just completely wrong. They say, well, that's pretty much what it is. And so we, we, don't, we, we have to realize that we have partial information, so we have to continuously monitor and understand. But when we, when we test this idea, this is then basically science. So then we, we're starting to say, well, okay, wait a minute. We're doing science. We're thinking about science. And then we say, well, what is science exactly? You know, is science a body of knowledge that's like, and, and it's engraved in stone, and that's exactly what we, it's not. Science is a methodology for testing an idea to see whether it's patently false or might be correct. And when we think about that, well, okay, so science is a methodology. We need everyone to be a scientist, everyone to measure everything, everyone to look critically and say, can I understand this phenomenon? And when we get to a certain level, our collective consciousness has changed. And when you're in a situation where you, for instance, have multi-year droughts, which are changing the availability of moisture, which are causing huge wildfires, then everybody needs to sort of contemplate this. And it's not about like, can I wash my car? Or what am I, am I you know, going to the golf course or something? It's more about, do we as a species understand the fundamental forces which allow us to live and which we are affecting through our ignorance and our greed? And then the, the, the answer to how do we address this is we don't make a prescription and do A, B, C, D. The answer is we look at this and we go, wow, that is a massively complex, multidimensional system. But it doesn't mean that it's not understandable, but it means we need to be very, very aware of this. And then we look at what the native populations and indigenous people were doing and what their cosmology said about the rocks and the, and the soil and, the, and the, the plants and the animals and the river systems and the sky and the weather. And we think, ooh, you know, they were considering this as a multidimensional symbiotic system and they said it's sacred. And, you know, compared to materialism and consumption and waste and pollution, that's a much higher level of understanding. And that's the type of understanding that can allow you to live in a place for thousands of years and never destroy the system. And then you see if you, if you approach the system, and what can I extract and take for myself, and everything is mine, and you know, then the result within a few hundred years is the collapse of that system. So the answer to this, the question is complex, and the answer is complex. So it's not a prescriptive one, do this, do that, listen to me, and I will tell you how to do it. It's that we must inhabit uh, a level of understanding, a level of consciousness that is higher than we currently have in this idea that we're consumers, we're, you know, and that it's okay to be a consumer. We may consume things, but the reality is we're human beings. We are not consumers. And in, as human beings, we're, according to our own wishes, our hope, our stated aim, we are homeo sapien sapien, which is supposed to be that we are wise, sentient beings. The wise, sentient beings. But actually, we're representing as if we're homo materialensis. So we are the material people. And so we're, we're just 
acquiring material things. Well, this is a, not a spiritual understanding. This is a wasteful and dangerous understanding. And the institutions that have grown up that say growth, jobs, money, the economy, social position, stratification, are the basis of our societal organization. Whoa, you know, these serve these corrupt, this corrupt thinking and give perverse incentives to destroy the, the ecological systems that we, that we depend on for life. So this is not the way forward. Finding a way to, to go beyond that to the next level of consciousness for all humanity and for our actions to reflect our consciousness because the, the, the landscape, our actions, are reflecting what we understand. So if we understand what I've just explained, we're going to act very differently than if we believe that gathering material things to ourselves are, is the purpose of life. So now the question is, how do we take this understanding, which has been growing over years and decades, and, and, and there's a, a rise in consciousness everywhere in the world. Because you can't look at these things and contemplate these things. The risk is high. And we have a lot of data, so when we, when we, the risk is high and we go, oh, we have to understand this. We have to understand why are the wildfires burning, you know, you know, and it's not simplistic. We need to go into the actual systemic symbiosis of all these systems and, and life forms to understand the answer and to understand what we do. So when we have this higher level we realize we need to go very gently on the earth. We need to have a much lower impact. And that we can have a positive impact if we understand the basic trends. And the basic trends could be simplified, but you don't want to oversimplify them to where they don't have meaning. Or, and you don't want to make a dogma. You want to have an understanding. But so, biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic material are the trends that emerge from microbial substances, organisms, multiplying and then differentiating and then massively differentiating until they include all the type, various types of life forms. Which is, you could scientifically state this as the infinite potential variety in genetics through mutation. That's not infinite variety, it's infinite potential variety. So that's very different from going in and saying, I think I'll take gene 59 and move it over here and put, put in another one from something else. And that's crazy because we don't know what the, the, the possible outcome is in 200 million years. So we don't have the knowledge that allows us to, to do that without consequences. There will be consequences. So when we, <clears throat> when we look at, at basic things, we know we must restore the soils. The soils must be massively biodiverse. The more biodiverse they are, and the more organic material, the more carbon is sequestered, the more habitat there are for the basic organisms that created everything, the microbial and fungal communities that evolved and created the atmosphere and the nutrient cycling which allowed for, for vegetative growth which then feeds the animal community as well as diversifying into huge canopies which maintain the microclimates. So once we understand that, you could say biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter are vastly more valuable, vastly more important than all material things. Everything that human beings have ever made and everything that human beings will ever make all together is nothing compared to these amazing systems. But we haven't known that. And now we can talk about that, so we're beginning to know that. So that's a realization. It's, we're realizing, oh, that's, that's true. You know, 
We can't get away from this. We're breathing air. We're drinking water. We're eating food. We don't want poisons in our food. We want our that we want to be in the shade. We want to be in the cool and the moist climate. That's where we, we, we come from. And when we destroy that, it turns dry. When it turns dry, the temperatures rise. The moisture is driven into the high atmosphere where it, it alters the relationship between solar radiation and temperature. And it doesn't precipitate because it doesn't reach critical mass. So these facts are not like dis disparate facts. They're, they're, they're things that if we understand, we go, oh, well, that's not so difficult, really. That's pretty complex and it's kind of neat that some interesting science person went and studied this and learned that. And now we know that. So we have to test it. Do we believe that? It doesn't really matter whether we believe it or not. Is it true? So, scientific method. Is that true? Does it work? Yeah, it pretty much works. Okay, that goes on the probably right, probably correct thing. So, not patently false, prob possibly right. You know, put it over here. So 21 grams of, of moisture for a kilogram of air, go check it out, you know. Does that work? If that works, everybody should know this. Exposed soils as opposed to below a canopy, temperature differentials, does that work? Yeah, that really works. I, I've been all over the world and wherever I go and I measure these things, I go, oh my God, we're in trouble. You know, so when you see these things and you know the relationship, the cause and the effect, you go, oh, stop. You know, everybody needs to know this. But you also get to the point where you go, because if you, if you go up and you grab people by the shirt and say, listen to me, I'm going to tell you, you know, and they go, get off me. I don't want to hear you. And who are you again? And, you know, so you can't even really do this. You can't teach anybody anything. They have to learn. And so, the only thing you can do is learn yourself. So I think for, for each of us, as we go through, we realize this is a pretty long process. It's been going on since the beginning of time. And, all right, we have cognitive ability at various capacities. Some are very quick and very clever. Some are not quite as quick and not quite as clever. But actually, that capacity doesn't determine who's better or who's worse. It means that we have differing capabilities. Because some people are strong and can run fast, and others are capable to create beautiful works of art, and others can talk a long time <laughs> about a lot of things. But so, and some can talk a long time about only one thing or, you know, something that they are massively uh, obsessed about. So, I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Yes. Not as short, maybe. As not, well. not short, but the you big can, picture is what we need to get yeah. to circle it all around. And so, yeah, the cause and effect, but then it's always... What's after that? What do we do with it? Do well, I think in the, you know, the, the thing that I've been looking at is that we need to do a number of things. We need to live more simply. So right now, in the, in the level of complicatedness, I wouldn't say complexity. So complicated and complex are different. Mm -hmm. The ecological systems are complex. The human social organization is complicated. And <clears throat> what what we need to do now is have less complications because we're wasting, we're using energy, we're causing pollution, we're making massive hierarchical differences in social understanding. So people who are social status, social opportunity. And what happens then is people who are high achievers and say, okay, it's okay, we'll be in competition with everybody, we'll win. And then, then they try to do that, 
and then they are successful from that perspective, but the society is in collapse mm -hmm. because all the people who can't compete with them fail and fall through the cracks. Well, that's not really success. That's not wealth, for instance. Mm -hmm. That's poverty. You just create it by, by believing that it was okay for, as an individual, to accumulate huge amounts of, of wealth to yourself. You created poverty for other people, disparity. That's uh, really something that we have to go through and, 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 um, and understand that there's an obligation to, to balance this out and that everyone has a role to play. That, that uh, being a high achiever isn't, isn't something which is better than something else. So someone, you know, I think we need to come together with an egalitarian way, in a very simple way to practice and discuss these things. So I recommend ecosystem restoration camps. So if you try to, to change the society, then you're really confronting all the values and understandings and the norms and the traditions and, and the vested interests who will fight to maintain their privilege. You don't want to do this. You want to let them go do whatever they're going to do. They're going to do whatever they, they're, they're going to do anyway. So if you confront them, you're actually not going to succeed in changing their minds, and you're going to also personally be thrown under the bus. So kind of what we need to do is realize that there, in, our, in our lifestyles, we need to have a more simple, less impactful lifestyle. So let's learn how to practice that. So where can you do that? Well, if we build ecosystem restoration camps and you can go have your vacation meditating and restoring soils and propagating and planting out trees, well, that's a good way to lower your impact. Plus, you're physically working on exactly what we need to do, which is increase the organic layer and the vegetative layer and regulate the hydro hydrological cycle. So this is basically the answer to your question of how do we deal with the disasters, the wildfires or these other problems. And then what we see is that this is just practice. Go and practice, learn about this. If you like this, I think there's a tribe of people who kind of represent the embodiment of an ancient legend that multi-racial, multi-ethnic people from around the world will all suddenly have this idea, let's restore the earth to the Garden of Eden. Okay, so that, how would they do that? Well, they would probably make very simple camps which have low impact, which are sort of natural and, you know, and then within that they would do the things that they need to do and they would probably share so that they're all eating together, so that they're very careful and they have composting toilets and gray water systems and they're very careful in all these things. Well, that's exactly what we need to do. So how do we do that? I think that the best way to do that is to join together to do this and all share, to learn how to share together. And so if we do this and we become a mass organization, say you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or a million people who have joined together in this effort, then even if they give a tiny amount we're recommending 10 euros per month, which is 120 euros per year. So that's like under $150. Then if that's aggregated, this is a huge organization. Now if that maintains a very life small, doesn't have real estate, it, it works from in the in virtual reality and in a camp, then this is this is really a low cost methodology. And then it has a huge amount of aggregated capital. And it can say, so if a, if a camp costs 300,000 euros, 
in capital cost to have just beautiful yurts and teepees and composting toilets and shower systems, or I would recommend saunas, because in, especially in, in water scarce regions, because it's a different type of cleansing. It doesn't use a lot of water. You can use solar energy to generate the heat. You can do all kinds of things. And then you, you don't waste water if you have 50 or 100 people all wanting to get clean twice a day. Or, you know. And then what you, 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 ha you, you have to say, well, everyone needs to eat. Everyone needs to sleep. And everyone in this vision, everyone is equal. So you have kind of like really nice glamping kind of conditions. And it's available to everyone. Everyone works and lives at together. And they don't work too hard. You have, you have more people coming rather than less people coming. And these, these facilities, you don't build them up for a festival and everybody drive there for a weekend or something or a week. You, do this and they stay there. And if you can go for a week or two weeks, you go for a week or two, and when you leave, somebody else comes. And, and it's a constant, everybody can learn all the things, the complexity, which is not, I mean, it's not necessarily easy to do restoration or even to understand these scientific aspects. I mean, I've spent decades trying to learn these things. But we don't have decades. We need to transfer this, this information to the population in a very rapid way. And so they need to experience that. So if they go to camp and they work in the soil and they work in propagation, they work in infiltrating and retaining water, they immediately learn this. So they don't have to spend decades studying it theoretically. They can just do it. And, and we also need to reduce our impact, so let's eat together, let's all have organic food. We don't, nobody wants to be ill and nobody wants to have poison in their food, so let's control the food. Everybody needs to drink very clean, healthy water, so let's control that. So those levels of technology, together we can do. And then it's not eat up to each individual, we, you know, we, 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 we learn to collectively do that. We, and then. We play music and we do yoga and we meditate as well as we do this. And then we're considering, well, what does it look like when we look from the from the mountaintop and we see the smog over the, the buildings and we see the traffic going in the highways and we think, well, you know, there's something fundamentally wrong with with this. And we look at the the kind of collapse of the governmental systems and the lack of, of societal understanding and the lack of trust and the lack of kindness and the kind of nihilism that comes in there and then the violence that emerges from, from this kind of loss of belief in anything. So, you know, we can address all of those at ecosystem restoration. And how can people follow along with this work? Well, it's online. I think if you want it, you find okay. it. If you yeah. if you don't want it, you won't find it. So, Perfect. but uh, we also need to realize that it has to be dis decentralized. Mm -hmm. It has to be self-organizing and self-governing. Mm -hmm. So it's not like this is a this is a movement. This is not a, a, a like you have to do this. It's not a dogma listen to me and do what I tell you. No, no, no. You have to become conscious. You have to contemplate and organize and understand what you're going to do. And be, be gentle. Be compassionate. Be humble about this. And, you know, at the highest level, you need to be selfless. Can you be selfless? Can you realize you're going to die? And that actually, you know, you don't really, in, individuals, we don't matter in some way that ultimately we all are going to give up our bodies and we're going to be part of the, you know, we're going to nurture the next generations of life and, and maybe our personalities will not remain and maybe that's not too bad a thing, you know. So, so the, 
you know, we, we need to cultivate kindness, compassion, selflessness if possible. Mm -hmm. the, the minimum level is mutual benefit, I would say. We need to recognize that what's good for you is good for me. What's good for all of us, we need to live in, in harmony mm -hmm. with the earth and each other. So that's like a baseline. You know, there's a higher level of that, which is like we're in love, mm. we're in you know bliss, ecstasy, joy. But I think that's aspirational. To achieve mm. that is something to wish for. But you know, don't hold your breath and don't don't make that the measure. Of, because we, whatever happens, we have a journey through life. We are living, and we will live our life, and in our lives, each of us will do whatever we are going to do. And we need to look at that, we need to look at what are our intentions? What are we trying to do? Mm -hmm. But, you know, what have we done? What are we trying to do? What can we do? And, and, and know, that we only have some time. We only have a certain amount of ability. We have a certain amount of energy to, to put into this. And then we pass on to another dimension. And so, you know, this is a very realistic point of view mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't be too attached to the outcome. Like, we want this, our, you know, willpower, we're going to do it, you know. Maybe not, you know. We are, something will happen, and it will definitely be based on how much we understand, and how kind, and how compassionate, and how collaborative we are. Because none of us can do this alone. We have to do this collectively, as a species, on a planetary scale. Mm -hmm. And probably we have a very short window of opportunity if you look at the science. So the science says within a very short period of time, we have massively altered the temperature differentials. We've changed the hydrological cycle. We're experiencing extreme and erratic weather events. And at current trends, these will increase in frequency and in intensity. And when you play that scenario out over, say, the next few decades or the next century, it gets very hairy in terms of predictions, um, very dangerous. So business as usual, when they say business as usual is not a, an option, this means that continuing with current trends lead to catastrophic so we need to do something different. What are we going to do? I recommend we create ecosystem restoration camps and that we, those of us who live in privilege, we share as much as we can to, to generate this outcome. And those who don't have any resources, go to camp, go camping, go enjoy, do yoga, go swimming, and grow organic soils because it's Actually, these people are the heroes. These are the people, and, and those people include migrants, refugees, homeless people, post-traumatic stress disorder veterans, people all over the world, young people who, who go to university and they say, I don't see really a future in the corporate world or in the type of governance that we have. Maybe we ought to do something different. I want to play music. I want to have, do recre I want to be rec you know, recreate. And, and play, but I want to have a purpose and I want to do something meaningful. Well, this is the great work of our time. This is the thing that we all have to do. So if we understand this and we do it, then, you know, this is about the best that we can do. Excellent. Thank you.